Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy McCready here at Rhombus University. We are here on October the 5th, 2023. And our presenter this evening is Dr. Fred Blackburn. And he is here to discuss the philosophy of mind and mental illness. So we are happy to have you, Dr. Blackburn. Thanks so much for having me. I'm yes. very excited. Um, I've been a college professor for over 30 years, um, primarily at San Diego Christian College. The last year and a half, I have been living up in Humboldt, California, but I am definitely having teaching withdrawals, so I'm very thankful for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to sharing um, one of my favorite topics is philosophy of mind, and I thought this would tie in really nicely with Rhombus University and especially your master's in psychology program, and you'll kind of get a taste of a philosophic approach to a lot of things that you all are dealing with from a psychological approach. And next week, I may talk a little bit about um, the history of psychology and how it came out of philosophy. At least that's my opinion and perspective. And we can talk about some of the early movements. And I'm so fascinated by, I'm really glad I checked in last week and watched the talk with your um, college president. And it was so interesting to me to hear um, some of the approaches they took in counseling, especially with addiction, um, drugs and alcohol addiction. And what was the name of the therapy he was using? Was it called coaching therapy or interview therapy? I didn't quite catch the, how he labeled it. Motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing. And I thank you. And as I was listening to him talk, it reminded me a lot about the early um, talk therapy where people would be engaged and they'd be encouraged to discuss themselves. And during that process, things would eventually come up, um, their struggles, their hopes, dreams, fears, what they wanted to improve, what they wanted to change in their lives. And so tonight I, I thought we would start with philosophy of mind and I got a PowerPoint. I'm going to share screen with you all, and let's get into it. So, philosophy of mind and mental illness. And one of the first big questions as a philosopher we have to discuss, um, we're kind of definition junkies in philosophy, and we like to define things to death. And so the first thing we have to do is define what is mind. And depending on how people define what the mind is, we come up with this different list of theories of then how people approach not only the philosophy of mind, but also how to apply it in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Anyone want to give a shot at defining what mind is for me? What is mind? Yes. I think mind is uh, cognitive components. Um, and being able to articulate those components. Would you be able to have a mind even if you couldn't articulate? Yes. Good. <laughs> okay, good. Anyone else want to give it a shot? Receiving and processing information. Okay. But a computer does that. It's true. Is well, there that's... some unique about the human mind that differentiates it from just like an organic computer consciousness oh consciousness and then that begs the new question right but that's the lat where we're headed this evening is i'm going to ask you to define what consciousness is <laughs> um for the ancient greeks not that they have all knowledge on all things but for the ancient Greeks, they separated the mind from the body. And in that sense, they were dualists. They believed they had a physical material body, but they also believed they had a non-material mind. And the mind was made up of three major components. The logos, which is like analytical reasoning. And then we have the cardia, which where we get the word heart from. So that would be our feelings and emotions. And then the highest function of the mind, according to the Greeks, was the nous, N-O-U-S. And they believe this is the realm of first principles, 
like if you're familiar with Platonism and the Platonic forms, that's where they believed would be that seat of knowledge. And so with those three combined, um, that was kind of the Greek concept of mind separating it from the Bible. Later, when we have Christianity coming in and kind of syncretizing a lot of Christian and Jewish theology with Greek thought in the medieval period, we do get this traditional medieval view that humans have a soul or spirit, which would be tied into their mind, their non-tangibles, along with a physical material body. And so that was very much a part of the Western tradition up until the 16th century. And it is there that we get a man named Rene Descartes. And if you're familiar with the history of philosophy, the 16th century is also what we call the age of reason. We have left the medieval age of faith and we've entered into the age of reason. And a lot of philosophers are now starting to reevaluate things that we had just taken for granted. And Rene Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, but he was a dualist. And in his philosophy, what he was emphasizing was that there are two substances in the universe. And these two substances are thought, which would relate to mind, and extension, which would relate to matter. So in thought and mind, he believes mind can affect other minds, like the ideas and concepts I'm sharing with you tonight in class will affect your ideas and concepts. But for me to physically affect you, I would have to physically touch you or use another physical object to interact with your physicality. And the same way, I could think bad thoughts about you all day, but it's not going to cause you physical harm. And so in the mental, in thought and extension, Descartes runs into a problem with what's called Cartesian dualism because he says mind can only affect mind and matter can only affect matter. But he also shared the belief that human beings were made up of mind and matter. And so the $20 million question becomes, how am I able to use my mind to move this matter? I mean, I can think at this bug all day long and I cannot even move it a millimeter, even though I have a pretty powerful mind. But if I get a thought in my head that I'm thirsty, that thought, the way Descartes described it, he said, the animal spirits in the pineal gland are agitated with the thought I have that I'm thirsty. And those animal spirits vibrate in the pineal gland, which affects the animal spirits in the blood, which will travel down my arm and grab my coffee mug, bring it to my lips, which will then, the animal spirits will vibrate up my arm to outside my pineal gland, which will let me know I've taken my sip, and then it will tell me to put my coffee mug back down. And what's so interesting is even in he's talking in these weird medieval terms like animal spirits, he's basically defining like the central nervous system before people were doing um, autopsies and really had understood the physiology of what it meant to be a human. Um, the problem is, even if that is true, and that's what's happening, it's not like we can put a camera into the pineal gland of the brain and look at what's happening, because what's happening is not a physical material thing. It can't be physically, thoughts are not physical material objects. And so, I really don't believe Descartes solved the mind-body problem, and it leaves us with this question of, why am I able to move this physical body, but I can't move other bodies external to this one? Any questions or comments on, on that? No? Okay. So he's the one that sets us off with this dualism. Um, later, we're going to get into monism and monist. There's two major types of monists. There's spiritualist and materialist. Um, then we will talk into behaviorism, which is kind of applied materialism to psychology. And then we're going to talk about epiphenomenalism. And there's a good $20 word for you.